Are you self-matching your adoption and worried that it might never happen? In today's episode, we're going to shine the light and show you how it is possible to reach your goals of adoption through self-matching with my conversation with Angela Kay. She is a single adoptive mom who just recently brought her baby girl home. If we haven't met yet, my name is Amanda and I'm an adoptive mom of two on a mission to make your adoption easier, faster, and more affordable. I do that through trainings and videos like these. So make sure that you subscribe and ring the little bell icon so you're notified each and every time I release a new video. In today's conversation, we're diving deep with Angela Kay. Angela Kay is an adoptive mom who self-matched with her baby's first mom through Facebook. In particular, she covers how she created her Facebook page, how she boosted her post and ultimately met her child's first mother, and then how she supported her throughout the entire adoption. You're really going to find a lot of value in today's conversation because Angela doesn't hold back. She shares everything. So let's dive right into our conversation with Angela, shall we? We are in for a real treat today. We have Angela Kay, who is an adoptive mom through self-matching. Angela has been gracious enough to come and share her story of hope and encouragement with you guys and to share the total process that she went through so that you understand more specifically how to accomplish your goals of self-matching your adoption step-by-step. Angela, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. I'm so excited to share everything that I've learned and pass it on. So that is awesome. That really helps our community grow and be stronger together. So I really appreciate folks like you serving our community. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, So tell us a little bit more about your adoption journey. So you adopted fairly recently, if I I remember correctly. I did. Um, So my little girl Ainsley was born on July 1st. And um, we are coming up on our last post placement visit, and we'll be able to finalize them in November. Yay. So, <laughs> just really excited for that. Um, but yeah, my journey started many, many years ago. Um, you know, I was always um, really thought that I would go to college and I would find Mr. Wright and I would get married and start my family. And, um, that just wasn't God's plan. Um, he had a different plan for me. So um, as I started to get um, older, my older, I mean, in my mid thirties, I decided that, um, you know, I just really still had this desire to be a mom. And so um, at the time I had been uh, a guardian at Lightham for about seven years with the juvenile court system. So kind of, it was a volunteer position and gotten to know foster care and thought maybe that was the avenue to becoming um, a mom. And so I went through the foster care training and um, as I was getting ready to start the home study process for that, my life kind of got up upended. I ended up moving um, back to the state that I grew up in um, and changing jobs. And so, you know, and through all of that really also realized that foster care just wasn't for me. Um, It wasn't something that I felt um, I would be able to do um, in my situation without, you know, a partner or husband. Um, There are some amazing single mamas out there who do foster to adopt and I, they're just special people. Um, But for me, it just wasn't, wasn't for me. Um, So once I moved, um, I'm in Michigan. And once I moved to Michigan, I actually found out about um, embryo adoption because again, um, you know, that desire to be a mom just hadn't gone away. And so I thought, well, that's really interesting. I'm adopted myself. And so I thought being able to, you know, have that bond of carrying a child, um, you know, that would be really interesting um, and a beautiful thing. So I looked into embryo adoption again, um, kind of went through the steps to see if it was a possibility. It would have been Um, But the more I started to think about it for, again, just personal decision for me being a single woman, um, when I thought, you know, if I'm going to be a mom and I'm taking care of this newborn, I did not want to be recovering myself. So um, because giving birth is is a lot of work. So so then I was just kind of, you know, back to square one, Um, you know, I was thinking about private domestic adoption, but the dollar signs really scared me. It's hard, um, isn't it? Yeah, it's just, it's so expensive. And again, 
Um, in my situation, I'm a single woman and, um, you know, so it's just one income and just, you know, thinking about that, even with two incomes, you know, it, it's a, a big, you know, financial, you know, it can be a big financial burden. So, um, really then started to hear about self-matching and I was like, what is this? Like, I've never heard of it. And, um, the more I learned about it, the more I realized that this was really kind of where God was leading me. It was an opportunity to have a very organic adoption plan, um, an adoption journey. Um, and, you know, obviously the financial piece of it for me was um, really interesting because it was uh, much less to self-match and go through that process. Um, and so I decided to just kind of jump in with both feet um talked to everybody that I, I could um joined i think every facebook group out there <laughs> um, which yeah. is one of the ways i met you amanda mm -hmm. um and you know really just started asking questions and you know kind of learned learned as i as i went along this process and there were several people who um you know i spoke with that taught me things about how to self match and um, you know, again, just, it was a lot of work, it, you know, it was, um, it, you do a lot of your own marketing and, um, putting yourself out there, learning how to create a website and learning how to use Facebook and, um, you know, all the advertising through that. So, um, what I ended up doing is self-matching through Facebook, um, which is, you know, getting to be more and more well-known now uh, in the adoption community and so through that process again creating a website and i can go into more detail too if you want sure. um so i ended up um, the first thing i did was i knew i wanted a home study and i wanted to have that complete before i went live uh, you know on on facebook and so or online and so I went through, I found an agency that I was able to do my home study with. They aren't a placing agency. They just do home studies and then post-placement studies. Um, so met with them, went through the process of that, all your fingerprints, um, you know, lots and lots of paperwork. Checks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as we all, you know, those are starting the adoption process. You get to do a lot of paperwork. Um, and so went through that process and then while i was doing that i also um i fundraised for uh, my adoption and i know that um you know some people are comfortable fundraising some people aren't comfortable fundraising it's really i think a personal choice mm -hmm. um you know at the end of the day the fundraising that i did and i think that most people do um is not for you know, you're not purchasing your child. You are just raising right. funds to cover some of those costs that you have with attorney fees um, and some of the marketing that you do and things like that. Um, so that truly was um, only, you know, with the fundraising that I did, that's where the dollars went. And I was really transparent about that because I just felt like- It's really important. People, yeah, I just, you know, people should know, like, this is why I'm doing it. You know, some people had never heard of that, you know, that I met um, along the way. And so I just really also felt that as I was going through this process, as much as I was learning, I felt it was a great opportunity to educate others um, about adoption and, you know, the costs of adoption and, mm -hmm. you know, all the ins and outs of it, um, because it's not, it's, it is not for the weary. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> Not for the faint of heart by any means. <laughs> for, for real. So um, so anyways, I so I did my home study and started to do some fundraising. And during that time, then um, I had announced um, for me, I just really wanted that community. I wanted the community around me to know what I was doing, um, to pray with me. Um, you know, they felt like it to come alongside of me. And so I had an adoption group that was private on Facebook where I kept, um, you know, I called them my village, um, where I kept my village updated on what I was doing. Um, so when I did fundraisers or when I was working on a website, um, you know, I let them know about that. When I created my Facebook page, that is the page that I use to actually reach um, expectant moms, 
Um, you know, I would ask people to like the page because you're working with Facebook algorithms and that can be a whole nother podcast, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> <For> sure. <laughs> um, and so through that, um, you know, again, it, it really was for me, uh, you know, a full time job. It, you know, I, the amount of time that I spent um, just learning how to use different tools and methods of advertising. Um, you know, did take a lot of my time, but, um, you know, it was really, it was an interesting part of my journey. Um, once I got to um, having my Facebook live, um, the page live, then it was just a lot of uh, making sure there was a lot of content on there. Um, and then I would uh, boost a post once a week that ran Thursday through Sunday. Um, and then I also once a month would do like an ad and um, I can get into more detail if you want. You have to let me know in a little bit, but I'll just kind of do high level um, sure. doing the Facebook um, posts. And then um, I will say that coming up, you know, I'm a fairly creative person, but having to come up with content every week and every couple of days really to kind of keep that page going. Um, that was difficult for me. And I got to a couple months in, um, and luckily I met this amazing um, gal on Facebook that um, she did like social marketing, social media marketing. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to connect with her and eventually hire her to just run my page. Um, because at that point my job was like getting busier towards the end of the year and it was just, you know, something kind of has to go in order to kind of keep that sanity. Um, plus, when you are going through this process, um, there's just so much of a, there's so many roller coasters, right, that you get on. And so you have, um, you know, the excitement building up to your launch and then you launch and then you're like waiting on pins and needles for somebody to reach out. Um, and then if somebody does reach out, you know, you have, you go through that conversation and, um, I was really lucky that uh, I did a lot of research and talked to a lot of people. So I was very aware of scammers um, and what to look for and kind of the questions to ask um, to kind of weed that out. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd also um, prior to starting had kind of secured the attorney that I wanted to use so that when I did get to the point where I felt like, OK, I want this maybe conversation to go further, I could direct them fairly quickly into the conversation um, to my attorney to, Good. you know, check it out, make sure everything was yeah. legit. Um, you know, it's sad that you have to do that, but, you know, the part of the journey, too, is guarding your heart. Um, it is. You know, you want to put yourself out there as much as you can, but yet you still need to make sure that you're taking care of yourself, um, you know, both mentally and physically. and. Um, emotionally through this process. Um, really important. Yeah. So um, I had been probably live. I went live at the end of August of 2020 and um, had talked to one person in Florida that I ended up not deciding to go or continue to work with her. Um, I, I believe had at that point like two scammers that I knew I, you know, caught on pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and then December 26th, um, I received a message early in the morning through Facebook and, from um, from Allie and she, we just, I don't know, there was just something immediate about it. We kind of hit it off, um, the questions she was asking me and the, you know, I always felt like it was up to the expectant mom to lead the conversation. I wanted them to be comfortable, you know, asking the questions. And then I would kind of just jump in here and there. Um, by that afternoon, she had already reached out to my attorney. Um, and that was a Saturday, which was pretty amazing. Um, and we were, it was just kind of the fast track from there. Um, on, I was able to then in January, early January, she had. Uh, the first her first ultrasound um, which was a 12-week ultrasound and i was able to attend via zoom because we were you know 
yeah. still in the kind of height of COVID and, and everything like that. Um, I was really fortunate that she was also located in Michigan. Um, so that was really, you know, definitely a blessing, definitely very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but still, again, we were early on in our relationship. Um, but to be able to go and to go to that first ultrasound was was pretty spectacular. Um, that. Yeah. And gosh, over the next six months, we just really got to know each other. We met in person a few times. Um, we talked about anything and everything um, that had to do with, you know, how she was doing. Um, you know, she was able to, I was an open book. She was able to ask me any questions uh, that she had. Um, and I will say the one um, interesting piece that I you know, found was that I was doing a lot of, um, you know, you, there's a balance between like how close you want to become, like you want to be close enough to have that open adoption. And, and as an, as a, you know, adoptive, hopeful adoptive parent, you want to put yourself out there as much as you can so that they're comfortable, um, and want to continue to say, yes, you know, I'm, I'm giving you this amazing gift. Um, but at the same time, you also want to, again, guard your heart because up until everything is finalized, this is not really your child. It's, um, you know, this, this woman's baby. Yeah. And I wanted to be really, really cognizant of that throughout the whole process, uh, making sure that she felt loved, that she felt supported no matter what her decision would end up being. Um, and that was really, really important to me. Um, as I've gone through this process now and spoken to a lot of other adoptive parents and in a, the adoptive community, um, you know, I don't, there isn't a lot, I don't see that a lot of um, expectant moms and then birth parents, um, you know, get that support. So many of them don't. And so I really wanted to make sure that at the end of the day, no matter what the outcome was, I wanted her to feel loved and supported. Um, throughout the process. And so it was a lot of, you know, texting and phone calls, um, making sure that, you know, she was mentally in the right place. Um, and so that was, took a lot of energy that took a lot of, um, mental space, uh, you know, in my, in my life. And, you know, I don't regret it. I, I wouldn't change a thing because I feel like she truly, you know, we built that trust. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, that is one thing that I just, again, I just felt so strongly about and wanted to make sure um, was there for her. Um, made sure that prior to, um, you know, the birth that she was able to get into some counseling, um, things like really that. Important. Yeah, just, you know, again, just having that support for her, that she had support other, you know, whether it be family support or friend support, but that she had other people in her life um, and we had the hard conversations. I wasn't, I don't know if it's my HR background, so I do a lot of <laughs> counseling with employees, but, um, you know, I just really, I, there were times probably when I was either the big sister or the mom and, um, you know, we had some tough conversations. Uh, you know, I remember one time we were, um, we had met at a park and we were having lunch and, you know, she was like, her, she said, my biggest fear is that you will take my, take the baby and, and disappear. And I said, well, my biggest fear is that you'll, you'll change your mind. And, you know, so we talked through that. And then we also talked about, you know, obviously we'd gotten pretty close, you know, over those six months and yeah. we shared a lot of um, information and detail about our lives. And, you know, we had to have the conversation about how that was probably going to change after the baby was here. Um, you know, I would be busy raising a, a child and she would be, um, you know, really busy trying to move forward. And, um, you know, in our situation, she ha had a, a daughter, a young child. Um, and so she would need to continue being mom to that child. And, um, you know, and just really being able to, um, you know, continue with her life because there, she did, you know, she had mentioned that she, her life has kind of been put on hold, right? Mm -hmm. While she was right, you know, 
um, caring and nurturing this child. And, um, you know, once uh, Ainsley was born, that at that point, you know, that would then, that the caretaking of Ainsley would go to me. Right. Um, and so, you know, we had that conversation about, um, you know, what our relationship would look like. And we actually ended up putting together um, in writing because for her, like, she wanted to see something visual, something that she could go back to and, um, you know, that was tangible that she could see where it said, you know, we're going to try to meet twice a year. You know, one time I'll come to you, one time you'll come to me. Um, you know, you know, of course, the attorneys were very concerned that, you know, there's <laughs> something in writing. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is a few, we're humans, right? We right. Need to, we need to be able to connect. And for her, that was just is what she needed. And, you know, that's really important, I think, for us as hopeful adoptive parents is to really be in tune with what that expectant mom and then later that birth, the birth mom, um, what her needs are, um, you know, because it, I mean, they've just given you the, the most amazing and selfless gift um, ever. Um, and so I just think that's just a small thing that we can do. But um, so anyways, we had put together kind of this uh, promise agreement and she was able to see like, you know, she can call, she can text me once a week, you know, like we put boundaries and parameters around it. So we yeah. both felt comfortable moving forward. Like we're still going to be available. We're going to ha always have the most recent addresses of each other. Um, you know, even to the point where I needed to go out of state um, I had to get permission from the court, but anyway, was, you know, going out of state the first month after Ainsley was born. And, um, you know, I made sure to text her, hey, you know, we just arrived in Ohio. Hey, we just got back in Michigan. And those those little things, like just that small communication um, was really, really important for her. Um, so anyway so then ainsley was born on july 1st and i was able to be there for her birth um it was a, ended up being a scheduled c-section um so i was able to be there and have skin to skin with her um took her home from the hospital 24 hours later and um has been with me ever since so wow um She's a joy and I love watching her grow and continue to have a relationship with her birth mom, Allie. Um, what we did actually is I created a Facebook group. It's a private group that is just her and me. And I think um, she's invited her boyfriend um, to be in it and another friend of hers. Um, but it's just four of us in there. I mean, she can invite whoever she wants to, but it's just very right. private. and. Um, the reason that we did that is because, you know, you talk about, okay, I'm going to send pictures or I'm going to do this. And the thought of that was just really daunting for me to like, have to remember, like once a week, I'm going to send a picture on, you know, Sunday or, you know, I, I'm going to every Christmas or whatever. Um, and I thought like, what, and, and the thing that I thought about too was like, what if I send her pictures in the mail and she's not in a great space? Yeah. And now she gets these pictures and it's just like a trigger for, mm -hmm. you know, all these emotions. And I just didn't, I did not feel that that was, you know, I, I just didn't want to do that. I didn't want to ever be someone who caused any more pain for her. And so um, we created this Facebook group and I post pictures and videos on there. Um, usually weekly, sometimes a couple times a week. It just depends what's going on in life. Right. Um and she's able to go in and look at those when she's in the right space. And, you know, she never has to worry that, you know, we, we go away because they're always going to be there. So, so if Allie needs to take a month off because she's not in the right, you know, kind of place to be able to go and look at those pictures or videos, she's able to go back and still see the progress, um, you know, awesome. Ainsley and, um, it's just always available to her. And so um, that's kind of what has worked for us. And we've been doing that for almost four months now. Um, and it's been really working well. And there have been times when, um, you know, we, we talk about adoption and how, you know, it's, 
everybody is so excited about adoption, you're bringing a baby home, but there's also this other side of adoption where there's a birth mother who is experiencing a huge trauma and a huge loss. And, um, you know, I think we need to be really aware of that, um, not to the point where, you know, we need to be, you know, happy and joyful about our situation, but just being just cognizant of that. And, you know, there have been conversations that I've had with Allie where, you know, she's, she's hurting, um, you know, and there is, it's, you know, it's tough. It's a tough thing, I think, as an adoptive parent to, to know that something that is bringing you so much joy um, is causing so much pain. Um, but the beauty of, I think, open adoption and Allie and I being able to have the relationship that we have is that we can have those conversations and she knows that, you know, we're always here. Yeah. So, um, like I said, that kind of brings you to where I am at this <laughs> point. Um, but it's just been, you know, a beautiful blessing, self-matching definitely was the route that I needed to take. Um, I think kind of maybe circling back when I have talked to other people about self-matching for me, I think as much as, you know, if you are, um, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. And so obviously I know that I'm ultimately not in control, but, um, this made me feel like I was in control a little bit more, <laughs> I think. So, um, you know, I hear stories about people working with agencies and things like that. And they have like this middleman, you know, between them and the, the um, expectant parent. Um, and I was just glad that I never had that. Like, I loved just having that straight connection with Allie. Um, you know, we didn't have to worry about anybody else. It was just her and me. And um, was it probably a lot more work? Like I said, that mental that mental headspace of, you know, being either the big sister or the mom or, you know, the coach, whatever it was, um, however you want to define that. Um, it was for me, I just felt like I was more in control of the situation. Um, I wasn't waiting for somebody to tell me this many people have looked at your profile. Like, right. I always knew that, um, you know, the weight is, is hard. Um, I was very, very, very lucky, and I, I, I do not discount um, that I was that. You know, for me, it was only six months, really, until I matched. Um, I know that there are people out there that have gone years, and um, whether they self-match or whether they're with an agency, and so I, I understand how blessed I am. But it is there is a period of of waiting. That period of waiting is is tough. Um, and so I would say to make sure that you surround yourself with um, other expecting and adoptive families, um, build that village around you. It's so important. I was able to find a group here in West Michigan that um, of other moms that, you know, either had adopted, were waiting to adopt, were wow. starting the journey. And, you know, that's just really important. So whether you find it via Facebook or you find it via live group in your town or your city, do it. Don't be afraid. Like, just join. Right. Because they will be there for you. They will help you when you have the questions of, you know, am I doing enough to get my name out there? Um, you know, they, they can help with those questions. Yeah, I think the village is so important because it is, I mean, it just like what you're doing today and sharing with the village of like, hey, like shining the I always use this metaphor of like shining the light, like shining the light of like what's coming up ahead, guys. Like it is possible. It's not a train. It is really a light. Like there really is something at the other end of this journey. And it is such a blessing. and so amazing. Um, well, one, thank you for sharing all of that. I'd like to jump in and ask just a few questions to, to really help. Um, the, my community on Facebook had submitted some questions specifically that they wanted to hear. And you touched upon a lot of it throughout the journey uh, that you shared with us. So specifically in finding Allie, how did Allie come to find your page and, and learn about you? So on my page, um, so like I mentioned, I boosted posts um, and I always boosted a particular post on Thursday, to run Thursday through Sunday because those are the most traffic days. 
Mm -hmm. And when you boost a post on Facebook, you can tell it like demographics. So you can choose the age range. You can say just women. Um, you can choose states. You can choose interests. And through all of that, um, by putting all of that together and then running the ad, um, she was then opened Facebook one day and um, said that Saturday morning. And she saw my ad come up on her feed. And so, um, my understanding is that those work basically you know how you get those sponsored ads that you get on your feed so it kind of comes up like that and so she just saw my picture it was a picture of me um and i had a little blurb in there about you know wanting to become you know a parent and um i believe it was also uh just talking to to the whatever expectant mom i was reaching um you know just saying you know, you're, you're an amazing person that you're even considering, you know, doing this. And, um, and so she saw that from there, she was able to get to my page on Facebook. And then my page linked to a website that I created on Wix, um, mm -hmm. just free website. Um, I am not a web designer by any means, but I was able to put it together. And I really use the website as um, what you would probably consider a profile book that um parents would put together like if you're working with an agency so in that website um i am not like a writer i'm a talker <laughs> <laughs> and so i just and i i wanted again i wanted it to be very organic and i just felt like i could i could somebody would be able to see me and know me and hear me better if i did a video than if i just wrote something out Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> You're right. That is how people yeah. learn to make an emotional connection is they need to hear your voice, see your expressions. They, they need to, all of that in order to make that connection. Yeah. So I just sat down one day with my iPhone and, um, you know, and, and I just recorded myself as if I was talking to that expectant mom in the same room. And I just kind of laid my heart out there and said, this is who I am and this is why I'm doing this. And um, I did two kind of different videos. One kind of, you know, the birth mom or expected mom letter. I did a video and then I did another video that just kind of talked a little bit more about me and my, my background. Um, and then I, I mean, I did have pictures on there, different activities that I enjoy and things like that. But um, I mean, it was only four tabs. It, it was pretty simple. Um, and it really, I just really felt like that video is what would connect us. And um, at the end of the day, that's what it was. Um, you know, she was able to see that video and, and hear me and see me. And that is what caused her to reach out to me. Um, and so she then sent me a message through Facebook. So, um, you know, dinged on my messenger and uh, we were able to just start talking that way. Yeah. yeah, that little ding can change your life. That's it can, yeah, absolutely. That is so amazing. Well, thank you, one for for sharing that. That's really helpful. I know a lot of people have questions as it relates to you know does does social media work and where do you take them and all of that. Um, and I have a training that I walk people through how to do that because it is it is really more common. I think another thing that you touched upon uh, within your story that you shared is getting support for your first mama for your first family mm -hmm. and i do think that's really important when we think about self-matching we often think about how do we replicate the agency process without all the overhead right and having that one-to-one -one connection but in having that one-to-one -one connection it is so important that you're setting the expectations of what life is like at the end of this journey and making sure that they have the appropriate support all the way throughout. So kudos to you for being really attuned to that and setting down and having that contract. I think that that contract on connection and how you're going to connect after Ansley was home was, and I know just a brilliant thing to make her feel more comfortable, but it got you both on the same page and it really sent those communication signals of, I appreciate and support you. And I'm not going to live up to your fear of just ghosting you. Like we're going to have something set in stone that says, this is what we're going to do. So kudos to you really finding that way to be supportive throughout, but also communicating what was really important to you in the end, which was respecting and understanding that, that first family dynamic as well. Yeah. 
It's huge. Um, well, I'd like to just ask you if there's any other tips. You've given so many great tips that are out <laughs> our conversation, but any other tips or advice you'd give to someone that is self-matching their adoption? Um, just, I guess, be prepared to, to do the work. Um, you know, I the other day I was talking with somebody and they were just like, I don't know if I can do this. And I'm like, if you, you know, you got to know, like, if you yeah. want to self-match, then you got to be ready to put in the time. Um, it really is, um, for me, it, I mean, it really was like another job. It was a part to full-time job, you know, um, in the, you know, for me, I was able to, to do a lot of it during the day, just because of COVID, um, you know, my, my job at the time just wasn't as busy, but, um, you know, if, if you're working full time, you've got to be able to, um, you know, look at your Facebook page in the, at night and answer questions and, um, you know, be ready for that roller coaster. That I think that would be the second. Um, I mean, I guess I don't know how, how you really can be ready, but yeah. um, <laughs> just know that, you know, there's going to be times where you're waiting on pins and needles and other times where it's, you know, crickets. Um, and then other times when things are fast and furious, um, and all those emotions are valid, um, all your emotions that you're going to have are valid. Um, don't feel, ever feel bad about having those. Um, but again, find your village because those are the people that are going to come alongside you and say, it's okay. <laughs> you know, what you're thinking isn't crazy. What you're, you know, going through is not, you know, uncommon. Um, and again, even if you, you know, my first village I found on Facebook with, uh, you know, a group that, um, you know, of other waiting parents. Um, and so just being able to, to step out of your comfort zone a little bit and have conversations or ask questions um, is really important. That's awesome. Well, thank you again so much. We certainly love hearing a great success story, but most importantly, it's a supportive success story. It's really awesome. So kudos to you for really respecting your child's first family. And thank you again so much for serving our community by continuing to, to shine the light of what's possible. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, wasn't that conversation just amazing? Angela was so forthcoming with all of the details that you really need to understand when you go into self-matching your adoption. I was so encouraged to hear another success story on how getting the right message and then sharing that through social media and boosting your message actually can help you match your adoption. So all said and done, Angela's adoption process was about six months. And guys, I know that is probably a little on the short side compared to maybe how long some of you've been waiting. But if you're interested in learning more how to self-match your adoption, I always have free resources to help you. You know, I've always got your back that way. So if you want to learn more about self-matching your adoption through social media, head on over to myadoptioncoach.com backslash social media training. And if you go there, you'll learn more about how you can do trainings live with me via Zoom, of course, and we can dive deep into really putting together your specific plan. And if you have additional questions about self-matching, be sure and check out these other videos or additional podcast episodes wherever you're consuming this content. Remember, friend, anything's possible with the right plan and support, and I've always got your back. I'll talk to you soon, friend.